anniversary of the assassination of social psychologist and Jesuit priest Ignacio Martin Barreau and seven others on November 16th, 1989 by members of the Salvadoran Army's Alcatel Battalion, financed by the United States and trained at what was then the US School of the Americas. We gather this evening to commemorate those events, but more than that, we also celebrate the ongoing work of people who walk in the footsteps of Martin Barreau and the Salvadoran peasants and students with whom he lived as they have embodied his work in the grantees of the Martin Barreau Fund. And finally, we celebrate those who have persisted in seeking truth and justice in the wake of gross violations of human rights, including the long delayed conviction just three months ago of one of the masterminds behind Ignacio's murder. As many of you know, Ignacio Martin Barreau's life and work were bold responses to the conflicts of his time. He lived in what he frequently referred to as a limit situation of the Salvadoran conflict wherein the polarized choices forced upon him were to either be with them or us. He chose the side of the popular majority and he worked among the peasants in his many capacities as citizen, as priest, as educator and social scientist. Many of us gathered here this evening have taken inspiration from Ignacio or Nacho as he was often called by his friends and his Jesuit colleagues. We have been, as you will hear from our speakers this evening, inspired by his praxis. That is what Ramsey Lehm, the co-founder of the Martin Barreau Initiative described as, and I quote, his persistent effort to understand the psychological dimensions of his experience and in doing so to expand the scope of psychology. This essential connection between doing and thinking a commitment to the oppressed and the production of a critical psychological insight to create creates one of the most challenging legacies of Ignacio's work and life. The Martin Barreau Initiative for Wellbeing and Human Rights at Grassroots International is work that seeks to celebrate his accomplishments and is one small effort among many others to support and sustain a liberatory praxis towards creating what he called for, that is a new person and a new horizon. The concept of liberation evokes notions of overcoming oppression and securing a better future for those who have been deprived of their well-being, including food sovereignty, education, housing, health, and an integral community. Ignacio envisioned a future in which imperialist and colonial foreign influence, government corruption, and state violence and a national academic apparatus that obscures these realities would give way to a more democratic society that would serve the majority of the Salvadoran people. He envisioned a Latin American psychology where liberation of the individual person and of what he, the whole people, that is El Pueblo, would be realized through a new praxis or an action reflection process. He called us into a new way of knowing and being one that emphasized the truth of the popular majority as it was constructed from below. This new psychology would be grounded, he said, in people's reality and would foster the liberation of all peoples. He utilized people's virtues in recovering historical memory and de-ideologizing everyday experiences. The Martin Barro Initiative for Wellbeing and Human Rights <laughs> seeks to sustain this vision and the priorities of liberation psychology as exercised through community groups of the majority world. Since its founding in 1989, volunteers such as yourselves here tonight have raised and distributed over $1.6 million through efforts, including those of many of you. We support grassroots initiatives of marginalized minoritized communities who redress harm from gendered and racialized violence, anti-black police violence, settler colonial occupation of lands and territories and forced displacements among other violations. They do this through organizing as local survivors and protagonists, engaging in transformative change strategies that draw on the traditional knowledges that foster healing and ensure personal and collective well-being. Through organizing and activism, these groups and peoples engage the political and ethical imperative 
powerfully articulated by Ignacio, and I quote, to make a contribution towards changing all the conditions that dehumanize the majority of the population, that alienate their consciousness, and that block their development of their historical identity. We are challenged today by the triple crises of the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, economic recession and pending depression, anti-Black racism, inequities and violence that have disproportionate effects on peoples of color and low-income communities. These crises exacerbate the social suffering of communities due to the ongoing systemic and structural violence of colonialism, patriarchy, and capitalism. The challenges revealed through these multiple crises invite us to listen beyond the borders of dominant knowledges crafted in the global north. As students, as professors, as activists, as community organizers, and as donors who contribute in small but important ways to this work, we are challenged to join in community and draw on the wisdom and praxis of our ancestors, as well as those organizing to build a new society in which we hope to live. I'm delighted to welcome you here this evening as to accompany us as a supporter, an ally, or an accomplice of some of the groups and social movements, including two that you'll hear from tonight, whose work draws on the liberation praxis of Ignacio. These activists persist in transformative change efforts healing that, that offer healing and well being in the midst of ongoing continuities of violence and violations. First, we'll hear from our executive director of Grassroots International and then from our two grantees, followed by a presentation by Michael Reed Hurtado, a colleague of Almudena Bernal, who could not be with us this evening but who works closely with the Gwenica Center for International Justice. You'll have an opportunity to leave your questions in the Q&A column on the webinar, and we'll get to as many as we can before the end of the evening. So thank you for being with us tonight, and I'm delighted to introduce you to Chung Wah Hong, the Executive Director of Grassroots International, a global justice advocate and grant-making organizer she has led Grassroots International in the last years as one of the more progressive organizations in the United States to have a high impact with, in solidarity with social movements in the global South. Thank you, Chung Wah, for joining us this evening. Welcome everybody. And thank you so much, Brinton, for your remarks and your deep commitment to human rights and liberation, which I get to witness very frequently um, since you're a board member of Grassroots International. Um, but my deep, deep gratitude to, we have almost 150 people joining us from around the world. And um, uh, I'm feeling the, the energy of global solidarity for this work that we are doing together. Um, so today is a celebration of Martin Barrow and his legacy through the work of the Martin Barrow Fund. Uh, and of course, the work of the frontline organizations that are the grant, uh, 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 grantee partners around the world. Um, Grassroots International has supported social movements in the Global South for over 37 years. And when we welcomed the Martin Barrow Fund as uh, the new host organization last year, that marked a big milestone in our work because our work is more complete because we're able to incorporate liberation psychology and healing into, into our um, uh, work at Grassroots International. I believe that philanthropy in the United States is suffering from a crisis of conscience, complicity, and consciousness. And the only way that we can get out of this crisis and we emerge with a new vision is through what Martin Barrow and Brenton described as liberatory praxis, both as individuals and community and as, as a people. And for Grassroots International, praxis means accompanying social movements. We do that through fundraising from progressive donors in the US to fund social movements in the global south. We support uh, groups that struggle for human rights, movement building, sustainable livelihoods, uh, grassroots feminisms, and healing and well-being. 
And at Grassroots International, we create space for those who want to engage in this praxis, where we close the gap between theory and actions, bridge the gap between the inequality between the global north and the global south, and practice solidarity philanthropy, a different kind of philanthropy from charity, and one based on our making a commitment to living according to our conscience and acknowledge our complicity and act to undo the damage that we as a country has done. And finally, the commitment to awaken our political consciousness by learning from our movement partners. Um, and with you, we want to continue to grow this community of praxis. And I want to end um, because we have so many amazing speakers. I just want to um, end by um, thanking everyone who was in the event planning group, the advisory group, Boston College students, um, Meredith Hawkins, Dorothy Burlidge, Grace Kavanaugh, Elizabeth Rice Smith, Sarah Egelberg Nolan, Ramsey and Joan Lim, Nelson, Pat, Timothy Kars, Ben Achtenberg, um, and the grassroots team. Um, uh, so thank you so much. And now I turn it back to you, Brenton. Thank you so much, Chung -Wa. It's wonderful to have you. It's wonderful to be with Grassroots International. It's my privilege to introduce Kitan Ndelbi, who is speaking to us in the middle of her night with great gratitude. We thank you for adapting to this side of the pond. She's speaking to us from Palestine. And despite the late hour in her home community, she agreed to join us tonight to talk about her work. Kitam received her master's degree in expressive art therapies at Lesley University here in Cambridge, Massachusetts in 2009. And in May of 2020, she received her PhD. The focus of her doctoral project at Lesley was using playback theater, a research process that she facilitated with a group of adolescents in the Kualadia refugee camp in Palestine. After finishing her master's program, Kitam returned to Palestine to carry out a dream of hers of having a mobile bus, art bus, that would reach every child in Palestine. She will be speaking to us about some of that work this evening. The Martin Baro Fund funded her project between 2015 and 2017, and she will also tell us a little bit about her more recent work. Thank you, Kitam. Thanks for having me here. Um, and thanks to all for listening to my story. Uh, I am trying my best to be awake as much as I could because it's uh, 2 a.m. here in Palestine, but I'm really uh, happy and thrilled to be with you and to share um, part of my uh, work, the recent work in Palestine. And thanks to Martin Baru for helping me with the mobile art bus. Uh, after um, I came back to Palestine after I finished my master's degree and uh, I really appreciated all effort you gave and uh, all the support you gave and um, indeed without that effort and that support we couldn't make um, our project I couldn't make uh, my dream come true so the dream that came uh, through was the first dream that came through after I finished my master's degree was the mobile art bus that you helped me with. And I want to share my screen so I could... Um, okay, where is that file? Hmm. Should be at the bottom of your screen toward the middle. I just opened it just two minutes ago. <laughs> um, I can't find it. <laughs> Do 
you see a green sign on the bottom of the screen? Yeah, yeah I, I did click that, but I can't find the file. It's on my laptop, but I can't find it. <laughs> is it, it, Hitam, is, this, is it the same one you sent me? Yeah. Okay, I think I can do it. Okay. If I'm lucky. Hang on one second. It's here, I found it. Oh, yeah. okay. Perfect. Okay. Thanks for trying to help. Uh, I know that I have uh, 10 minutes, so I will start with the mobile art bus um, that I had a couple of years after I finished my master's degree. And uh, the idea of the bus was um, to have bus to reach Palestinian kids all over. And the reason that I had that bus, first of all, it was a dream, but also uh, the dream wanted to reach every uh, child in Palestine. When children couldn't reach me, I thought maybe through this beautiful bus, I could uh, reach them. And we, we tried and we managed, we did succeed to reach uh, many places, many refugee camps and many villages where uh, our children would really do any art. And it was a beautiful, um, a beautiful project. And uh, what we did within the bus and outside the bus was basically art, uh, different kind of art, like drawing and painting and moving and sound and um, music and, and dance. We, we, uh, we did two kinds of work. Part of the work was within the bus. We had a group of kids who could get into the bus and do art within the bus. And uh, beside, beside the bus, we had also uh, tables and the chairs so we could work with, uh, within the bus and near the bus. I always had uh, volunteers with me who could help me because I couldn't do that work by myself. But in each place, to each place uh, we reached, we arrived, we had uh, volunteers from the refugee camp itself or from the city or the village or teachers who also uh, helped. So it was uh, fun activities, art activities, um, After, and we, I, I worked on the bus for almost four years. Then I had to do my PhD at Leslie. So I had uh, no time to do two big th things uh, at the same time. After I finished um, my PhD program, I was also uh, working on my mobile art car. And with this car, I tried to do the same to reach places where uh, children or students uh, couldn't reach us. And, and I say they couldn't, it's either because of the closures or because of the checkpoints or because of the wall or because of the sometimes just, you know, political heart, heart um, situation or condition in Palestine, and that that's the the that the idea that when they can't reach us, I try uh, as much as I could uh, to reach them uh, through my uh, mobile art car. I couldn't uh, do big, big, big things like what the bus did, but at least um, I did manage. Uh, to go to many places and, re and reach uh, as much as I could children. And I still have that car and the car still functions. And uh, through this car, I um, managed to do many projects. Like I started a new project uh, four years ago in the Bedouin villages, neglected villages, uh, abandoned villages um, near Jerusalem or uh, Jericho area. And the reason I chose the Bedouin villages is because of the big need there and um, lack of art, lack of um, fun activities and lack of colorful uh, 
activities. So I started uh, a project in uh, Arab al Jahalin, Arab al Jahalin village. Arab al Jahalin village is not that far from Jerusalem, but it's one of the poorest um, uh, Bedouin villages in Palestine. And we started with this van that it was it was used before, but um, then it was abandoned and neglected and needed a lot of work. So we started with the van and we started with just a small group of women from that village. And now the van runs three different projects, uh, the women project and children project and the adolescents uh, project. So the kids come uh, to the van and do um, art activities and sometimes also fun activities in Arab al Jahalin village. I had um, uh, two volunteers with me who worked, uh, Hamda and Manal in the beginning, and uh, they, uh, they did a marvelous work and they were fully trained. And right now they run uh, the, the three projects in the van and I just uh, supervise them and give advice and give help sometimes. And they also, Hamda and Manal, were very supportive with me when I started a new project two years ago in Khan al Ahmar village, another Bedouin village between Jerusalem and Jericho. And this village was um, invaded two years ago uh, by, uh, because the decision of the Israeli Supreme Court was to demolish to demolish uh, the village in order to, to, to build a road between two big settlements that surround uh, that village and that actually were built on the, on the, on the land of the, the village. So I decided um, to start uh, the project in Khan al Ahmar in order to give support to women and children and students there uh, from the idea of when they decide to destroy or to demolish something somewhere, I try to build something in that place. And we started the project under a tree. We worked for six months with a group of women under the tree. Right now, we have a house that was donated from um, one of the people there. And we run three different projects in, the, um, in that house. This is the beautiful one who came with his mom and we had no place uh, to put him. So she created this a beautiful bed for him, the swinging bed. And this is the house that was donated. We call it house because it's, it, it's a tent, but in the Bedouin uh, sector, the Bedouins call it house because it is their house. And this is the house that was donated from um, one of the family members there. And right now we have three different projects that we run in this house. This is one of the projects, the children project. Okay, now I want, uh, so four years ago, as I said, I started my PhD program and um, I decided to do my research uh, in Kalandia uh, refugee camp uh, about using, and it was about using playback theater with a group of teenagers, adolescents. And the reason I, I decided about the playback theater is because uh, it is a theater method that is based uh, on um, improvising, uh, acting out stories that come from uh, the audience. So it gives the, the opportunity to the audience to tell their stories and the actors who are trained in the playback theater improvise uh, the story um, on spot, on stage, in front of the audience. The reason I chose Kalandia Refugee Camp because Kalandia Refugee Camp is one of 
the, um, the biggest, the most crowded, and the very harsh uh, political condition there because Qalandia, uh, Qalandia checkpoint was, and it is one of the worst, they are all <laughs> ugly and bad and, <laughs> but Qalandia checkpoint is one of the worst uh, in Palestine and it was built on the entrance of the camp not that, not that far from the houses and the, 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 the students and the schools there. So clashes occur almost every other day, if not every day, like also yesterday, the news talked about very harsh clashes there. So I thought maybe by uh, giving these uh, teenagers a chance uh, to do some drama and so some acting and tell their stories, maybe I can save their life at least for the period of the research. Um, I did the, the research with 11 uh, teenagers, boys who came from uh, the same school. And this is the checkpoint that I had to go through uh, in order to reach uh, their um, school. And I was lucky that I had the chance uh, except once when we had to cancel because of the clashes um, and uh, the martyrs that uh, were killed uh, in the camp and everything was shut down for a couple of days. So other than that, I managed to do the research for two months and I got help um, with um, playback theater a trainer who did the work with me. And uh, I finished the, the, the research and um, I graduated uh, in May. So that a checkpoint um, with all the obstacle uh, in it didn't succeed to stop me from doing my PhD in Qalandia refugee camp, hoping that I will be back sometime after the COVID uh, to work with the boys again to do some more uh, projects with them. Thank you so very much, Hitam. I, your... I just wanted to finish with this um, uh, very short sentence from our poet Mahmoud Darwish, who wrote once, and we would love life if we could find the path for it. Yes, Mahmoud Darwish, we love life, and if art is the path for it, I will follow that path. Yes, Mahmoud Darwish, we love colors. And if the sun sends us some colors, I will color my life with it. Yes, Mahmoud Darwish, we love music. And if the instrument sends us melody, I will dance with it. Yes, Mahmoud Darwish, we love life and will find the path for it. Thank you so much. Thank you so very much for sharing your path and for facilitating the extraordinary possibilities for children and youth in Palestine to, as you described, take destruction, demolition, devastation, and build a path. We deeply appreciate your being with us tonight. Thank you so very much. Yeah, you're welcome. And now we would like to introduce to you Natasha Duncan and Yolsan Lim. Natasha Duncan is the eldest sister of the dearly missed Chantelle Davis. At the age of 23, Chantelle was killed by the New York Police Department detective Philip Atkins in June of 2012. Chantelle's untimely and unjust death spurred Natasha to become a dedicated and fierce police accountability activist. Knowing that young people have a key role to play in building a fair and just world, Natasha founded a nonprofit organization called Justice and Beyond and organizes Hoops for Justice in her sister's honor. This annual basketball tournament brings together youth from all over Brooklyn for a day long friendly competition while exposing them to the work of the progressive organizations that sponsor the event. Natasha is a leader of the grassroots organization, the Justice Committee, through which she organizes for police accountability and systemic change with other families who have lost loved ones due to police violence. 
This year, Natasha joined with these families to help lead the successful Communities United for Police Reform campaign to repeal the Police Secrecy Law, or 50A, and to pass special prosecutor legislation. Natasha's mission is to keep Chantel's memory alive through fighting for justice and beyond. Your son, will, Liam, will join Natasha. She is a social justice organizer and artist. She worked closely with the Justice Committee as a volunteer and consultant between 2007 and 2012, when she joined the organization's staff as its co-director. As a representative of the Justice Committee, she sits on the Steering Committee and Executive Committee of Communities United for Police Reform, and she co-chairs its Community Empowerment Working Group and helps lead the grassroots coalition People's Justice for Community Control and Police Accountability. Previously, Yulsan was a staff member and consultant with Notatal for Korean Community Development, CAV Organizing Asian Communities, and the Audrey Lord Project. From 2003 to 2010, she also served as the co-coordinator for the multimedia exhibit, Still Present Past, Korean Americans and the Forgotten War. The Justice Committee is a current grantee of the Martin Badalo Fund. Thank you, Natasha. Uh, good evening. Thank you so much for having us. Um, it's, a, it's definitely an honor to be here. Thank, thank you to the foundation, the Martin Borough Foundation. I'm sorry about that, for, for, for having us. Um, as you stated, I'm Natasha. I am the eldest sister of Chantel Davis. Um, my sister was killed by NYPD Detective Philip Atkins. Um, my sister was in a vehicle that crashed. She was driving on Church Avenue in Brooklyn. It's um, one of our busy, busy streets in the, in the neighborhood. Uh, Detective Atkins approached the vehicle with his gun drawn, attempting to remove my sister from the crashed vehicle. Um, the information that we've gotten from Detective Atkins regarding what happened to my sister that evening was only through an interview that he did with the newspaper that he stated his gun discharged. My sister lost her life three weeks after her 23rd birthday. After, after um, Chantel was killed, as in, all these, as in all the cases, when police take lives of black and brown people, NYPD criminalized her and blamed her for her own death. Um, my sister was dehumanized and made out to be some mastermind criminal. They, a, a normal practice is, um, you know, they, they released illegal, illegal arrest records of things that um, she was never convicted of and the media just ran with it. They picked up the story and repeated everything. She was literally plastered all over the news before we were even notified that she was killed. And this happens to, to victims across New York and across the country. And, um, you know, we just, we had to, to fight for accountability, but also to clear Chantel's name. That was like top priority. On top of losing my sister to the NYPD, everything came after like uh, further injustice. The NYPD grabbed surveillance footage from the stores around. They took cell phone, people's cell phone from whoever was witnessing the event. We couldn't get any answers from District Attorney Hines at the time about the investigation. In fact, he had he had a policy of not sharing any information with families of victims of police killings. We were we were left to fight tooth and nail for answers. And right before the sixth memorial of my sister's killing, um, we still had no idea a status of the DA's investigation. They kept telling us that it was being investigated. It was not until the third district attorney who we have now uh, after organizing and applying pressure that we finally got a meeting that, that we learned that the DA Hines had closed the case without convening a grand jury. And DA Gonzalez told us that he was sorry for what had happened to my sister. However, the statute of limitation on manslaughter had run out. And he, doesn't, he didn't believe that it was intentional, it was murder. Um, Chantel's murder made me an activist, an organizer overnight. Um, I'm still learning, obviously. Um, I didn't even have time to grieve. 
it's eight years now. I, I just had to take to the streets. Um, I started an organization in Chantel's honor that is aimed at empowering Brooklyn youth and inspiring them as community leaders. I joined Justice Committee, which I'm very thankful for that organization, to which I, I, I unite with other families who have lost loved ones. It's thousands. Um, one of uh, police fight for, system, for systemic change to end the cycle of police violence and systemic lack of accountability for the, for the black and brown communities. Last year, I was able to join um, the leadership body of Justice Committee so that I could help ensure that, you know, JC continues and deepen its work to organize families that have lost loved ones to police, to police violence. Um, Justice Committee, they bring families together. We have um, lost, you know, loved ones together to help lead and build the power of New York's racial justice movement. We've been organizing um, past state police reform law since 2015. And this past June, the families and justice committee and all the organizations um, under Community United for Police Reform achieved a historic victory, threefold victory at that. Um, New York State Assembly and Senate both passed the Police Stat Act, 50A repeal, and our legislation to ensure special prosecutor for all police killings and deaths in custody and governed the governor signed all three bills into law. So the Police Stat Act is, um, will, will give us data and, uh, on police killings, low level you know, enforcement across the state. Um, of course, my experience with the Brooklyn District Attorney is, um, you know, is why we passed the special prosecutor law. DAs work hand in hand and they rely on local de police departments every single day. So through special prosecutor law, we look to empower to we look, to, we look to the power to prosecute killer cops. Um, we took that away from the DA who have this you know, systemic conflict of interest. The repealing of 50A, which is, we also call that the um, policy secrecy law, police secrecy law. We are tearing down the wall of the secrecy of the NYPD. That's, that's, that's first and foremost. Um, New York police departments have been using protect, protect protect abusive officers, including those who murder our loved ones. Um, since we repealed 58, which police disciplinary records, they, you know, they seal those records. You don't, you don't get to see them. I've learned between like March of 2004 and February of 2012, Detective Atkins had been the subject of 41 allegations um, of, mis of misconduct made by the Civilian Complaint Review Board. And at the time that he killed my sister, there was um, four lawsuits that the city had already paid out and two was pending. So, the, you know, this systemic problem, so many of officers uh, who abuse and kill, kill are repeat offenders, you know, it's never their first time. It's always multiple things that have led up to this and then it escalates. Had this misconduct and the sheer number of complaints been taken seriously, you know, Atkins had been, if he had been held accountable, my sister would be alive today. So, you know, people, people who, who are not directly impacted by, by police do not always understand the extent of the impact systemic policy by police violence have, have on the, you know, the well-being of black and brown communities. Not only are we like losing people, not only are people getting beat up and thrown in jail, our communities are traumatized every day. People are conditioned to believe they live in an open air prisons. Um, you're, you're liable to get stopped and searched for little to no reason at all. Every interaction with police increases stress levels, regular routine, your daily routines turn deadly. Um, half of our population, we're conditioned to call the police. However, for black and brown communities, you have to think twice about doing that because the outcome looks very different. It breeds a culture of self-blame. Um, if they were doing this, then this wouldn't happen. You know, and um, you just get blamed. You get blamed for having a wallet that looks like a gun. You, you just don't feel valued or, or a part of society. And the only way to build true, safe and healthy individual, individuals and communities is to make sure this ends. And the only way we can make sure this ends is through organizing, building, building people power. And this is what organizations like Martin Burrow Justice Committee and um, you know, other organizations have supported us to do, which, which I'm very grateful for. With the three victories um, this year, the work is far from over. 
We are already fighting the police unions in court because they are trying to roll back the repeal of 58. Um, the special prosecutor for all police, it doesn't mean we can stop you know, rising and demanding accountability. Right now, the attorney general um, in New York, Letitia James, um, we have to keep make sure, make sure she's doing the right thing and follow, following the law, keep, stay on top of her and hold her accountable. Um, now more than ever, we need, we need to build unity and power. The families need every, everyone's support to lead the movement. There are, there's always, you know, call to action and steps you can take. I'm asking um, if you can follow, follow Justice and Beyond on Instagram, follow Justice Committee on, on social media outlets. I think um, somebody we could put it in the chat for people to see. So just look out for organizations that are, that are really taking leadership from families and people who are directly impacted and, and get involved, get involved in your community. Th that's, that's what we need at this moment. You'll sign, I'll pass it to you. I think we're going to do the video next, right? Yes.
Thank you for playing that video for us. Um, I'm going to try and keep my comments super brief. I just wanted to take a few minutes to share a little bit about the work that lies, for he lies ahead for the Justice Committee. Um, there is currently a nationwide trend towards developing alternative crisis response models for people who are in emotional distress. There's good reason for this. Depending on what statistics you look at, between 25 to 50 percent of those killed by police are people who have mental health diagnoses. Um, crisis response models that are being promoted and tested frequently involve some kind of collaboration between local police and mental health care providers. But if you look at the historic origins of formal de police departments in this country, which are rooted in the genocide of um, the genocide of and seizure of land from indigenous people and the enslavement of kidnapped Africans, and you look at the role that the police continue to play in maintaining racial, social, and economic hierarchies for the Justice Committee, and I hope you'll also see that this is completely illogical. Um, it's illogical to think that you will get the same result if police remain involved in crisis response, uh, that you will get a different result if police remain involved in crisis response. It also continues what is a dangerous and insidious trend of police expanding their role into social service areas like mental health response, schools, and homeless services. So instead, in New York City, with leadership from family members like Hawa Ba, the mother of Mohammed Ba, um, we are calling for the complete removal of police as first responders to those who are in distress and for the simultaneous investment in community-based, culturally competent post-crisis and preventative care. And we need progressive mental health professionals and the progressive mental health community to support this work and to help us in calling out the problems with models that involve collaboration with the police. So that's one of our main fights right now. Another uh, main battle we have in 2021 is to defund the NYPD. We're demanding this not only because police are terrorizing black and brown communities, but also because, and especially in the midst of public health and economic crisis, we need the dollars to go to these communities which have been systemically dis divested from for decades. It's literally a matter of life and death. Um, these days, you see a lot of officials playing to the right by bashing the movement to defund the police. Um, you see it in New York City, you see it across the country. That's because defunding the police is not just about minimizing violence and criminalization. It is a demand for radical transformation of what our system values based in the understanding that we have to address poverty, white supremacist, uh, sorry, white supremacy, and systemic inequity in order for our communities to be safe, healthy, and able to thrive. Ultimately, this is what Ignacio Martín Barro taught, and this is what the Martín Barro Fund is all about. Um, and so support from the Martín Barro Fund has been so meaningful for the Justice Committee, not only because we need the financial resources to do the work, but also because we have deep alignment around these beliefs. And so I'll end by saying thank you from JC to all of you. Thank you so much, Natasha, Hitam, and Yolsan for these extraordinary examples of the leadership you and your communities are giving to all of us, walking roughly in the footsteps of Martin Barro and the Salvadorans with whom he walked. As many of you know, the Martin Barro Initiative has been and continues to be funded by the generosity, compassion, and commitment of individuals who care about human rights, mental health, and community-led healing. To support these efforts, the Martin Barreau Initiative raises every dollar every year to keep our grant making vibrant as we support groups such as those whose work you have heard tonight. These uncertain times have been difficult for all of us and most especially for grassroots communities around the world. As the COVID-19 pandemic continues, existing inequities are exacerbated and they're often reinforced by violence and with disproportionate impacts on black, indigenous, and people of color from systemic and structural injustice, such as those that Hitam and Yulsan and Natasha have described. Meanwhile, state and non-state actors are brazenly using this crisis as a pretext for power grabs and repression, and impunity persists. Those responsible for violating the rights of Palestinians and African Americans about which we have just heard go unpunished, leaving an even bigger need for the Martin Barrow Initiative to respond boldly with financial support 
to the amazing projects like those you've heard about tonight. And importantly, we will shortly hear from Michael Reed Hurtado, human rights lawyer and journalist at Guernica Centro for International Justice about the extraordinary efforts of many to challenge impunity, the critical success in prosecuting one of the intellectual authors of Ignacio's murder, thanks to nearly 30 years of advocacy and activism by Michael, his colleagues, and many others. And in this momentary transition to our next speaker, we urge you to support the work of the Martin Barro Initiative at Grassroots International. Every gift matters, so please give like you mean it. And this evening, every gift you give will be doubled thanks to a matching challenge that we were able to raise. So to donate online, as you see in the image before you, go to grassrootsonline.org slash MBI dash gift. Please consider a gift of $500, of $100, or of $31 to mark the 31st anniversary of Ignacio's murder. Whatever you can give will be deeply appreciated and doubled. Thanks for going online in this brief interlude when we'll hear some music from an Argentine group. Thank you all very much. And we'll put in the chat how you can give also in case you missed it on the slide. It's a delight to introduce Michael Reed Hurtado. Michael is a Colombian US lawyer and journalist with over 25 years of experience in the fields of human rights, criminal justice and humanitarian action, mainly in Latin America. He is a director of operations at the Guernica Center for International Justice and also teaches at Georgetown University, focusing on states crime, collective violence, denial of atrocities, and the sociology of lying. Thank you, Michael, for joining us this evening. I think your mute is on, Michael. Um, Michael, I think you're muted. There you go. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm sorry. I, I was just, um, I'm, I'm very happy to, to be here with uh, you. Um, I'm um, honored to be part of, uh, of um, this event and to be able to share with you a couple of thoughts on, on delayed uh, justice, um, some achieved justice, which is very important. Um, in this field, but however, still facing uh, a lot of problems regarding the needed justice um, in, in, in El Salvador in relationship to these crimes. Um, just looking through the participants that are with us from different parts of the world, 
I know that there are many uh, people who have thoroughly studied and have been inspired by Ignacio Martin Baró's writing um, in psychology, um, as well as in, in the field of um, analysis of political violence, which is something he did. As many of you uh, probably know, uh, Martin Baró was, was uh, less than 50 when, when he was assassinated. Um, and he had left a, a very prolific um, record of all his, his thoughts through conferences. Fortunately, many of these have been edited, probably not enough in, in English and another foreign language. Um, I use a lot of his writing in my personal research and teaching, and it is quite difficult within the United States to get his writings out uh, to students so that uh, they can find that level of inspiration that to this day continues to motivate the relationship with communities, uh, the unearthing of uh, state lies, um, and the confrontation of, of denial um, in, in all of Latin America. I have been part of uh, many initiatives uh, in, in Colombia, uh, working with uh, displaced uh, communities, with campesino communities, where Ignacio Martin Baró has been very, very present. Uh, so for me, it too has, has been uh, an incredible process as a result of my work uh, in El Salvador uh, through the IDUCA for many, many years in collaboration and in support of their efforts uh, to see this process through. And again, though a bit of justice was achieved with a final sentence on the 11th of September this year against one of the top commanders of the moment, Inocente Montano, um, it is only partial justice um, and um, it still leaves a lot of uh, due justice for victims in El Salvador. As uh, you all know, this, this entire case starts with a very gruesome killing um, in the UCA, uh, where six priests and two women, uh, one young girl, um, were, were assassinated by the Batallón Atlacatal. Initially, the official story was that the uh, guerrilla had gone into the UCA and committed the assassination. Uh, in fact, the cover-up uh, used uh, AK-47s and also used graffiti to try to pass on the responsibility. Um, Ignacio Martin Baró had in fact written about this type of official story in many of, uh, in a couple of his uh, conferences before this event, um, where he had denounced that this type of cover up had taken place in other uh, cases in El Salvador. Um, it is quite hard to read his writing on this subject and to see that he himself victimized uh, and the crime in which he was assassinated was part of this type of cover up and official uh, lying uh, that took place. Um, th this case obviously received a lot of notoriety in addition to, to the killing of the priests and, and the women that were with them. Uh, many other priests um, and other religious workers uh, working for the poor in El Salvador um, had been assassinated previous and after this murder. Uh, very often when working in El Salvador, people make an emphasis that though this case had such high notoriety, particularly because of Ella Curia, uh, one must not forget uh, the chain and the, lit the litany of uh, atrocities that had taken place and that have taken place in El Salvador and that are still demanding justice. Now, uh, this case again, being high notoriety was uh, figured prominently in the press. Um, it got a lot of international attention and, and some justice efforts initially, also part of the cover up, but it left a historical record. This led way for the Truth Commission to have it right in uh, the center of their report. The Truth Commission was so convinced with the information that they even named names of those that were involved in, in the moment. Some documents were annexed and they continued to be on record uh, being kept at the United Nations as a result of the archives of uh, this Truth Commission. Um, again, some uh, people were able to flee the country. Uh, there's a couple of protected witnesses that came to the United States that tell their own gruesome story of persecution and apparently um, also cover up 
that involves both U.S. authorities and ongoing intervention by Salvadoran authorities on U.S. soil. And again, that can be consulted in, in the trial that took place in Spain. Um, after this case was so highly notarized, the next thing that happened was the amnesty. And after the amnesty, though it leaves way for interpretation, um, judges in El Salvador were definitely not ready to move on this case. Um, after many years of the massacre, 10 years, in fact, the IDUCA decided to push the Fiscalia to start a criminal process in El Salvador. However, the judge in that particular case decided to apply the amnesty. That became part of a lot of litigation. It rose to the level, it, it, it reached the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court understood that this case was exempt and ordered the case to move forward. However, by that time, the judge uh, interpreted that the statute of limitations had told, that is that too much time had gone by since the initial event and that therefore justice also uh, was not available at that moment. And we didn't see much action on that. Since that moment, civil society, the family members uh, continued looking for different avenues of justice. Uh, for a while in the United States throughout the 1990s, um, a lot of uh, civil mechanisms were, exp uh, were explored in as much as um, officials of the military were present in Florida for a while. Um, in Spain, as a result of that country's legislation and universal jurisdiction experiencing and living um, probably its, its highest moment, um, publicly known uh, probably because of the Argentinian case against Chilingo, there appeared to be a possibility where as a result of the nationality of the priests, uh, some of them being Spaniards, um, as well as the type of case that had been committed, there was a possibility for the case to move forward. Um, after a lot of investigation, uh, there was a, an official complaint presented um, right before the 19th um, commemoration of uh, the, the massacre. So on November of 2018, uh, before the Audiencia Nacional, the a chamber courts in Spain, there was an official criminal complaint presented against several high ranking officers. This complaint was accepted and the investigatory judge began a process of investigation that gathered a lot of declassified documents from the United States, some documentation from the criminal processes and sham processes that had taken place in El Salvador. Little by little that process moved and a lot of information was accumulated. Now, the pieces also were kind of falling together in as much as some of the perpetrators were being traced and tracked throughout the world. Um, quite surprisingly, a dear colleague and friend, a journalist from El Salvador, was able to give my colleague Almudena Bernabeu a call in summer of 2009, inquiring to know what would happen if one of the perpetrators, and in this case, Inocente Montano, was present in the United States. And she immediately said, well, we can put the wheels in motion and try to see if we can, in fact, um, detain him. Starting in summer of 2019, uh, ICE and Homeland Security were activated. Uh, the detention of Montano did not take place until 2011, principally pushed by a publication in the press, which uh, made evidence of the presence of a war criminal in a US soil. Um, also notified by this uh, same event, Montano started moving south and he was eventually detained in the border of Virginia and North Carolina in 2011. Uh, Montano was being held on um, immigration fraud charges as well as perjury and as much as he lied in his application uh, for immigration, he pled guilty to these charges and therefore he was sentenced to detention. During this process, uh, there was a lot of action taking place in El Salvador as well as in Spain trying to move the case forward. The next step, and this is where you see that justice is just a, a lot of labyrinths that we need to get through. But the next step was being able to secure sufficient evidence against Montano, request an extradition order that then needs to be sent to the United States. 
That uh, extradition order was uh, finally approved by a district court in North Carolina in February of 2016. But then the next process is political. Now the executive needs to get involved and we were all trying to pay attention to what was happening with the Kerry administration towards the end of the mandate. And finally, on the 29th of November, 2017, Montano was extradited to Spain. He was presented before um, Spanish authorities and uh, the process uh, was able to move forward through Spanish law. Um, in the meantime, unfortunately, uh, some legal changes had taken place in uh, Spain. And again, here there had to be some amendments, uh, I won't be technical, to that process, uh, which basically implied that mm, the case against the Salvadoran nationals that were killed, that is one of the Jesuit priests and the, the two women, um, the girl and, and the woman, uh, could not be part of the justice process in uh, Spain. Seems very un, un, in, unjust, in as mu unjust in as much as the case uh, were the same fact patterns, but as a result of their nationality, the Spanish courts could not secure uh, the process. Long story short, the process was able to move forward. It goes uh, to finally to trial. The trial started in June uh, 2020. It was a fairly quick trial in the middle of uh, the pandemic. This is Montano back when he used to be the vice minister of, uh, of defense and a colonel. This is Montano right um, during his uh, moments of, of extradition. Michael, um, I'm just gonna ask you to slow down a little bit for the interpreters. I am very sorry, I'm running with Thank time. you. Yes. No, it's all good. This is, uh, this is Montano as a colonel. This is obviously what we have when justice is older, right? The, the subjects are now older. One can hardly think that this individual is, is responsible for atrocities. Uh, this type of, of time going by is quite problematic. Also time lapses and memory plays a lot of tricks. Again, long story short, uh, the case was able to be secured. The pandemic affected a lot of these matters. Uh, especially in the, the individual being in, in um, he's 77 years old, um, in a vulnerable population within prison, um, weren't too sure how the case was going to proceed. Um, again, the trial initiated with some safety regulations as a result of uh, COVID. A lot of it was um, in fact uh, uh, transmitted over um, the internet. And uh, this allowed some Salvadorans to be able to, to watch it. It was streamlined on a YouTube channel, um, probably a lot more meaningful and a lot more attention than if the trial would have just occurred in Spain. Um, however, not your normal trial, quite difficult dynamic within the, the courtroom. Um, some short sessions um, and as the case has evolved, we just saw, saw different uh, witnesses, expert witnesses, some ex-military. There was um, 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 a direct uh, perpetrator that turned uh, state's evidence and became a witness in the process that was quite interesting. Um, on the left here, you see um, a former uh, military officer that also provided information on that event. Um, and then different people involved in the different processes of the case. Several US nationals that provided testimony um, to them uh, and to the court. Um, as the case evolved, um, we finally got to the sentencing day. This is uh, on the 11th of, of uh, September. Um, and this is the day on, in a very cold day, very quickly, the final verdict was, was read. Um, this is a sentence reached uh, against Inocente Orlando Montano, only one of the perpetrators of many other named perpetrators uh, including generals, um, some civilians um, in the process that to this day have escaped justice and have not been investigated. His final conviction amounts to about 133 years. Uh, he got about 56 years plus for each of the uh, five homicides. Again, the sentence is written in such a way that it tells a longer story of persecution against anybody who was considered to be an enemy uh, in uh, El Salvador. Um, this is exactly the writing that Martin Baró 
wrote about on, on the dehumanization and the extreme polarization that made uh, people targets of violence and where state violence was justified. Um, some of the attitudes of the, of the defendant showed that his counterinsurgent dynamic, the way he had been socialized, the way he thinks, continues to put an issue of him believing that he was always doing good fighting this great enemy. Um, I think this final decision is a great achievement of justice, a big recognition of the family members, including the family members of Ignacio Martin Baró, uh, who to this day have been ones that have pushed for justice and who we directly represented um, as part of uh, the representatives of being the representatives of victims. However, I, as I have said, um, this decision by now um, is on appeal. We should get a final here, a final decision uh, very soon. Um, and that means in a, in a couple of days coming down, hope we are hoping for one that uh, confirms uh, the conviction. Now, that aside, again, this is a case that took place in Spain against one of the perpetrators for the five nationals that took place. The decision itself demonstrates that there is plenty of evidence to proceed against other presumed perpetrators, some of whom are on Salvadoran soil. Uh, and in addition to that, it also shows that this case was part of a longer pattern of cases that have been perpetrated in El Salvador and that are still demanding justice. In that country, the um, Supreme Court and the Constitutional Chamber of the Supreme Court annulled the amnesty um, starting in 2016. And ever since that moment, in principle, there are no more legal obstacles to proceed with the justice initiative in El Salvador. Of course, again, political resistance is huge. S those perpetrators that continue to be alive continue to have quite a bit of power and they continue in fact to demonstrate that political interests and economic interests have subordinated the interest of justice. And for now they have trumped the rights of victims um, that are claiming justice. Um, for those of you that know El Salvador, um, this country and its society is a very resilient society, one that continues to demand. Um, there are some current efforts and not only in the case of UCA, in the case of Monsignor Romero, in the case of the massacre of El Mosote, Rio Sumpul, and other very horrific cases that amounts to thousands of victims uh, where the cases are very slowly moving forward. However, again, with a very weak judiciary, lack of independence, lack of technical capacity, and a lot of attacks, both from private and public sector against that. Let me stop there. I've, I think I've, I've shot over uh, quite a bit. It's a very um, complex and very exciting case. Um, and we could of course stay forever. I've tried to um, make it uh, quite simple and tried to stay away from, from the legal lease. So I hope that has been useful and thank you. Thank you so much, Michael, and thank you all for being with us this evening. Um, there were a number of questions for Hitam, but she unfortunately, given that it's 2 a.m. in Palestine, had to leave us. But um, we will forward your questions to her, and there are several others that have been answered in the chat. We just want to close this evening Thanking you all for being with us. Thanking you all for your ongoing support of the Martin Barrow Initiative. Thanking our sponsors and our ally sponsors who were an important part of this evening together with you. Thanking particularly Natasha Yolsan and Hitam and also Michael for the summary of the trial and of the horrific events in El Salvador. As several have commented in the comments, there's numbers of overlaps in the denial, in the secrecy, and in the lying that takes place as impunity reigns in so many places. And so it is so critical to continue to push for truth and to push for justice and to support those people most directly affected by the events that we've heard about today. I'd also like to add a special thanks to Carol Shattuck of Grassroots International, without whom we never would have made it to this event. 
Thank you also to all the extraordinary volunteers, to Meredith and Sarah and Mary and Tuche and Grace and Liz and Dorothy and Nicole, our wonderful volunteers who really helped to put this event on. And thank each of you for your contributions to the struggles that we've heard about tonight and to sustaining the Martin Bado Initiative. We wish you well in these exceptionally difficult times and look forward to walking alongside you in our next steps forward. Thank you and good evening. <laughs>